Hi everyone. So I did my John Maxwell training this morning with uh, Roddy Galbraith and Susan, his wife. Roddy is the person that trained me and that has helped me to become a better speaker. As I've mentioned before, I have done speaking before in Canada uh, for U of T, for the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. I've written speeches when Mandela died, I wrote a speech and I sent it to U of T. And my colleague who had uh, helped Peter Mayer pick me to represent uh, Vits in Canada, she's a lovely Muslim lady. Her name is Fazila. And when she had told me, we, you know, we're looking, we're thinking about you, I said to her, but Fazila, you, you've worked with the faculty there and you are coming from that academic background. And Peter had spoken to me before that, and I had said to him, let me think about it. And then Fazila spoke to me. So I said to her, you know, I'm a little bit nervous because I don't have the support here. I don't, like I've never worked in academia full time in South Africa, and I don't have the skills you have. And she said, Belinda, you'll be fine. We just need you to step in and to step up and we know you'll be able to do it. So anyway, I took that on and I was successful in it. Unfortunately, Canada, as usual, did not give us the support we needed. Um, we wanted to bring students over for an exchange program. I went to Waterloo University and the people there were lovely, but they got the lawyers involved and the lawyers didn't give us the support we needed. So now the programs are being run from New York because New York has the money, they have the support, and over here it's just an uphill battle. So it's very hard. And anyway, my training today was uh, interesting and it was nice and it also helped me um, to motivate myself because Roddy and Susan understand my challenges and they understand where I'm coming from and the hurdles I faced, especially financially, it's it's tough. I mean, you know, it's over here, things are going up and you don't have the money to pay your rent. You don't have the money to get transport, to get food. And compared to even last year, groceries are costing almost double things that you paid, even basics like milk and bread. So no one knows how it's going to all end, but we put our faith in God. John Maxwell is based on Christian principles, whether we like, whether we like it or not, that's what has made society work. Whether other people like it or not, that's what has made society work. And when I came here from England, I was surprised at how secular Canada is. Um, you know, like when you go into New York, you'll find nativity scenes, you'll find Christmas trees. I mean, it's changing slowly, slowly. You'll see Christmas lights and decorations and all that being put up. But when I came here, I, I found it very weird. Like people were wearing badges saying, you can wish me Merry Christmas. So it was a big transition coming from England to here. And even with my accent, people say to me, oh, you sound very English. I said, well, that's how we were raised in Zimbabwe. You talk to anyone from Zimbabwe, we pretty much, this is how we speak. And they're like, oh, you sound like a school teacher or you sound like you came out of an English school. I said, well, that's how Zimbabweans are. It's not just me. That's how we speak. So I guess, you know, when you go through all this discrimination, that's part of the journey, learning to toughen yourself up, learning to push back when needed. Um, like for me, I got very offended when people said that uh, Brian Mulroney led the fight against apartheid. Maybe they're looking at it from their point of view, but from my point of view, he took a stand, which we appreciate, but he didn't lead the movement. And it's not a very polite way of saying that. There were, all, there were a lot of African leaders involved in Zimbabwe. There were a lot of African leaders and Indian leaders, coloreds, whites, blacks involved in Africa. 
in helping that movement against racism and bringing apartheid to an end. And if the clerk hadn't been there, it wouldn't have fallen. So, you know, the people here are, in a way, very arrogant because when you come in, they don't value your skills, they don't value what you're bringing to the table, they don't value what your experience is that you've been through. And they, when you ask for help, they say you have an attitude of entitlement. So it's very hard. It's very, very hard. And for us as women who grew up in Zimbabwe, we were very used to the men treating us with respect, opening doors for us, not swearing in front of us. And that's part of the schooling system. You, the guys used to tip their hats to the teachers. They, we were there, they would open the doors for us, it did other students. They were just very respectful. So it's very hard when you leave that culture and you come into this North American culture where so-called equality is being sworn at and shouted at and talking while people are eating about shitting and peeing and all this. That's what they do. And to them, that's equality. So, I mean, I found it disgusting. I, I really did. And it wasn't only happening in the workplace. It was happening at family gatherings. And of course, I never said anything because I wanted to be polite. But I guess, you know, you have to, you have to adapt or remove yourself from that. When you're in the workplace, you can't remove yourself from it. So it happens in the banks all the time. But, you know, I just keep quiet. I do my work and I, I don't say anything. I find that's the best way. And the other thing is that when you are going into the workplaces here, like even in Zimbabwe, we worked sometimes on Sundays. And sometimes it's not possible to get to Mass. It's not possible to go. Like we understand that's a precept of the church. They want you to go to Mass on Sundays. But if they are not pushing for businesses to be closed on Sundays or that anybody who is Catholic should, or Christian should have the Sundays off, then that's not our fault because we can't do it. We have to pay our bills, we have to work, we have to earn a living. And if that's the only schedule available, you have to take it, especially when you're like me, you're an essential worker. You get paid very little and you're required to take whatever hours they give you. It's not like the old days. In the old days, even when I came to Canada, an executive assistant would work Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or 9 to 5.30, and then you'd have your weekends off. It's not like that anymore. People are going in at the weekends. People are logging on from home after hours to meet deadlines. So it's a work culture here. And if you're not working, you're not valued. That's basically it. So when we look at our speaking, when we look at what we are bringing to the table, we also have to consider the culture. We have to consider who our audience is. We have to consider what cultural influences they are, because I'm not living in Zimbabwe, I'm living here in this country. So we have to make adjustments and we have to adapt. And our personal journeys are part of it. My journey may not seem extraordinary to the people that I worked with, but it may be extraordinary to somebody else. So we have to keep that in mind as well. And, um, you know, the things that the church values, like going to confession, receiving the Eucharist, um, observing days of fasting, providing for the needs of the church. If you don't have, if you don't even have enough to cover your overdraft, how are you supposed to provide for the needs of the church? And if they're building uh, private public partnerships with the banks and all these places, which are not paying us well, then how are we supposed to survive? So anyway, these are, these are all the questions that are being asked and that are unfolding. And when I took my spiritual direction, the hardest adjustment for me was moving into the emotions, moving into the emotional space. 
because we were raised to be logical. You make logical decisions in Africa because you can't, there's no time for feeling sorry for yourself, for saying I got hurt, I fell down, or I don't want to go to school today, I don't want to go to work today. There's no, oh, you know, you've got the sick day, why don't you use it? When you, if you're sick, you push yourself and you go because you don't want to lose that job. So it, it's, it was an adjustment. It was an adjustment getting used to things here, learning what they value, what they see as funny may not be what I see as funny. But it was a, a good training today. One of the takeaways I got was, um, they were saying like, if you look at animals, right, the golden retriever is always happy, welcoming, and at the other end, you have the German Shepherd. And the German Shepherd is reserved. The German Shepherd watches, but it doesn't, it's not this bubbly kind of dog. So I'm like that. I'm like that German Shepherd. I'm very protective of the family. I watch, I observe, but I am loving in my own way, but I'm not your ray of sunshine. I'm not an extrovert. And maybe that's why the spiritual direction component fitted with me, because in our church, we are not happy, in clappy people. We're not like, you do get the charismatics, but that's not what we generally do with our spiritual direction. So for me, it's been hard, it's been disappointing because I have not been able to earn what I would like to earn as a spiritual director. I do ask people to give me an hour of what they earn when I see them. Most of the time, people don't give. They expect it for free. And I take them because my idea or the notion is that eventually things will come back to me and I will be fruitfully rewarded. Unfortunately, financially, that is not happening and things are just getting harder and harder and harder. And even when I apply for executive assistant work, which I have experience in, or project coordinator work, um, you know, I'm, I'm not willing to leave a permanent job to take a three month contract and then maybe be out of work for another two years. So I stick with my minimum wage job and I move forward. And that's how it goes. That's part of the immigrant journey. It's part of adjusting here and it's part of living here. But even Deacon Bill at our church was saying, what would our country look like if we, as the church, said we want Sundays, we want on Sundays for our Catholics to be able to attend Mass? But it's up to them. I mean, for me, I'm one person, I do what I can. But if the Magisterium and the Pope and all these people don't push for it, why should we as lay people? If the Pope is going to support gay rights, and blessing of gay people in the church, we women are not going to sit back and say, well, you can control our reproductive rights and you can tell us that we can't take the pill. I mean, the women voted on it at Vatican II and they lost. So who lands up with the babies? Who lands up with the AIDS? Who lands up getting raped? Most of the time it's the women. So the church in Africa had had to rethink its strategy. AIDS is growing in Africa. It's not dwindling. The men rape the children because they think they're going to get healed by that. I mean, it's, it's stupidity. And the women have been fighting for the same things from time memorial, to have our own incomes, our own finances, our own properties, not to be treated like property not to have the men or anybody else make those decisions for us over our health care, over our jobs. And it's, it's not going to stop. It's not going to stop. They'll punish people like me for speaking truth to power. But what do you do? Do you just say, oh, well, I'm just going to accept whatever's happening? We don't. We don't accept it. And that's part of the immigrant journey. We have to speak up and we have to, we have to do it in a way that it helps to make things better, not just for us, but for other women and girls coming after us. And that's what matters. Even with you two, with Larry Mullen Jr., I'm glad he came back out because he started that band. Yes, I love Bono and I appreciate him as the singer and the lead, 
but you know, I also recognize that I'm from Africa. If Bono had the opportunity to meet with me or meet with an American or a Nigerian, he'll meet with a Nigerian because for him, I'm not important. For him, the Americans are important, the money's coming from there. And the Nigerians, they also have the resources, they have the oil, they have the connections. So someone like me is not going to get that meeting with Bono. I mean, we pushed for it when we went to the summit, but there were a lot of us there. So we know our limitations, we know where we're coming from, we don't have big heads. But we also try, we try to build up our incomes, our finances, set up our businesses, because we are worth it and we have to do it. Mandela didn't say that we can be the great generation for nothing because we've changed things. I've changed things. I changed things when I was at, in South Africa with the SRC, with getting our first black leader elected. I've changed things in Canada and I'll continue to change things. It may not be easy, but I will do it. I have done it and Fazila will support me because she knows. She knows my strength and my courage, and she knows my faith. And so does Peter Meher and all these leaders that are in South Africa. When I was, I was sick when the VC came, so I couldn't go. He was very disappointed. But the next time he's here, hopefully I'll be well, and I'll be able to go. Or maybe Vitz will set something up where they can pay for a ticket for me to go to the next event somewhere. I just stay open to the possibilities because that's all I can do. It doesn't really matter to me whether people like it here or not because I haven't been treated properly. So I just speak my truth and I try to change things for the better.